Welcome, beloved community. Welcome to this virtual and accessible space between and within the many places we are all located. I acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe that our seminary rests on, as well as name where I am in Chicago as the unceded ancestral lands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. Please pause for a moment to hold the land you are on, as well as the people from whom it was taken as sacred and holy. Our fellow classmate, Stephanie Nimala, is a dancer who uses a wheelchair. We will begin our time together in the form of a call to worship through a recorded blessing from Stephanie who wishes she could be here today, um, followed by an example of the inclusive, of inclusive dance close to her heart by Infinite Flow Dance Company. Hello friends, staff, faculty at United. My name is Stephanie and I am so pleased to be helping my friend and sister Elena by offering this blessing. I offer this blessing believing the words are true. I offer this blessing believing that you are held. I offer this blessing believing that these words I heard by divinity, also known as creating God, God whose pronouns could be us, could be all. I offer this blessing for whatever you are experiencing right now. I offer this blessing celebrating that whether you have a singular, dual, or multiple focus, you are cherished. I offer this blessing in celebration of all of your unique abilities and gifts. They are needed. I offer this blessing in all of the ways in which you experience and express in this world. Your expression is a treasure. I offer this blessing believing that there is a plan and a purpose that continues and continues and continues through all the days of your life. Amen. This is Mark chapter eight, verse 22 to 29. And they came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he'd spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist and others say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. I love that clip. <laughs> it always stirs something in me and I see God in it. Um, so thank you, Mr. Rogers, for those words of assurance. Um, and thank you, Sam, for reading the passage from Mark. <sighs> what a passage from Mark. I, what is going on in this story? Um, we see 
um, a healing. Jesus is spitting. There's um, men like trees walking. Uh, did Jesus mess up the miracle? You know, what's, what's happening? And then right after it, connected to it, Peter, for the first time in Mark, which is the first gospel written, says that Jesus is the Christ, which makes me think that what comes right before it has to be really important. So the Nancy Drew in me was really intrigued by this passage. In the past, I've heard this passage separated into two different sermons. One sermon being the two-part miracle sermon that teaches us that, you know, healing doesn't look like what we think it will, or it, it might take time. Um, and it's, it's kind of a chicken soup for the soul type sermon. And then the other sermon is that second piece with Peter. And it's usually this very, like, decide today who Jesus is to you, altar call type sermon. And those are not my sermons for today. <laughs> um, they're not my sermons. I'm keeping these two stories connected because it was Peter's epiphany that first told me that I needed to stop and take another look at this healing story in Bethsaida. Peter had a moment of recognizing God right in front of him and from a pure storytelling perspective, I wanna know what led to that. And as a community, I love knowing how we recognize God and exploring that together. I was surprised by how much changed for me when I looked at them in conversation together, these two parts of the same story and narrative. It's, it's not like this is the first miracle that's happened in Mark. This is chapter eight. And Jesus has healed a paralyzed man. He's brought a little girl back from the dead, fed a crowd of over 5,000, claimed, not claimed, calmed, calmed a storm, walked on water. I mean, if Peter is looking for like a miracle to prove something about Jesus's power or divinity, he had a lot to choose from. But in the few verses before this passage, Jesus asks his disciples after a different miracle, do you not yet understand? And in the chapter prior, Jesus says, then do you all also fail to understand? This very apparent theme of understanding is present in this part of Mark. The disciples almost seem like a kid who's you know, three books into the Harry Potter universe being like, wow, there's some wacky stuff happening at this totally normal boarding school. Jesus is like, okay, do you not get it yet? Because I'm working my miracle fingers to the miracle bone. <laughs> so what about this specific miracle in Bethsaida finally flips the switch in the narrative and gives Peter this aha moment that God is present? Well, first, this passage clarifies something that Jesus is not, a magician. Healing narratives in the time fall into three categories, magic, medicine, and divine miracle. And the lines between those categories can get kind of squiggly, which we do see in this passage as an example of that squiggliness. Um, but we can remember kind of a rule of thumb for those three different things that um, magic is a practice. Um, that overcomes a hostile force and that it's medical if it aids in like the natural function of the body. And it's a miracle if it is direct intervention from a god or goddess. Two major hallmarks of magicians of the time included performing in front of large crowds as well as the use of props or mediums to hold the magic. However, both stories in Mark 7 and 8, make a point of saying that Jesus withdraws from the crowd. So I think there's this moment of clarity where Jesus is trying to say, this is something I'm not. He's not a part of the crowd scene that is a part of being a magician, but it gets squiggly and a little magic-y because in both healings in 7 and 8, Jesus uses a very popular medium for the time, which was spit. So Jesus still has some magic vibes. 
And it is this understanding of what magic and miracle meant to people that leads me to believe that the story in Mark is not telling us about a two-part healing. Because the moment that Jesus uses spit, I think is the moment that nothing happens. I think it's the moment that the man is not healed. The healing comes in the second touch, just a touch, a simple touch that heals the man and allows him to see, which establishes that Jesus is more than even a miracle worker because Jesus is the one actively interceding with his own divinity, coinciding with the Christology of Mark. This healing by mere touch is dramatically opposed to how healing happened at this time. There was no culture of healing by touch that existed. Peter Elman argues convincingly that healing by means of mere touch, void of any additional manipulation, was not established as a pre-Christian idea. He contends that in Greek and Hellenistic texts, physical contact between healer and a patient imply or at least leave room for medical intervention. And it is never just touch. However, I think we do see healing and restorative touch prior to the New Testament, but it's just not human. We see it in the 10th chapter in the book of the Hebrew prophet Daniel. Daniel was a, has a, um, Daniel was a spiritual I'm sorry, Daniel has a spiritual vision where he is speechless. And the word for speechless used means to be physically unable to speak or having a bound tongue. Then Daniel describes something that becomes important to the gospels. Daniel describes God in human form or looking like the son of man, touching his lips and his mouth having a restored ability to speak. This part in Daniel is where we get the name son of man that is often used to describe Jesus to mean God as a person. Because of the vision, Daniel then tells the one in human form that he's in such pain and he's unable to, to talk and out of breath. And again, the one in human form touches Daniel and strengthens him and heals him and says, do not fear, greatly beloved, you are safe. Be strong and courageous. And Daniel is like, awesome, keep talking. Um, and the next thing that the son of man says is, do you know why I have come to you? So this passage establishes a pattern that we see in Mark of the son of man touching the one he is restoring twice, um, which also happens in Mark 7 with his healing. And then we also have that inquisitive, do you know what this is about that happens after? And just to drive the point home, Jesus then refers to himself directly as the son of man in verse 31. There's, there's some, some big connections being made here between these two books. And it's immediately after that healing that Jesus calls, calls Jesus the Christ. In between the not a magician failed healing and the son of man miraculous healing, we have the poetic vision of men like trees walking. We see the same word for looking up used in Mark 8 that Jesus, uh, that was described as Jesus looking up to the heavens before healing in Mark 7. So looking up, not around, but up. I think that tells us that this moment is a spiritual vision from the man from Bethsaida. God giving a poetic vision to a man while he is still blind. Turning yet again to the visions in Daniel, already established as a text that Mark is connecting to, I see similarities in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, calls for Daniel to interpret his dream, and he uses the name he has given to Daniel, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians. So Daniel gets the struggle. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar's dream entails a tall tree being cut down, but the stump remaining rooted. And Daniel's interpretation is that the tree in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is his reign as king. 
and for a time he will be dethroned. But the rooted stump means that his kingdom will remain rooted and be reestablished over time. Trees represent rooted dynasties, kingdoms, empires, systems of earthly power. For the man in Mark 8, to see people like trees walking suggests that the empires and powers of humanity have been uprooted because the kingdom of God has come. Something new has begun. Jesus is to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to free the captives, and to set at liberty those that are bruised. The kingdom of God being present is hugely important in Mark. It's the very first thing that Jesus says in the very first chapter. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. I don't think Peter was the first to recognize Jesus as God present. I think the man in Bethsaida was. So much changes for me theologically when I view the vision of the man at Bethsaida as a spiritual vision while still blind. Honestly, debunking magicians, uprooting empire couldn't be more up my alley. And if either of those is what dialed Peter into God being present on earth, I'm into it. But the place that I recognize who Jesus is to me is the moment that he takes the time to ask a man he knows is still blind what he sees. He doesn't tell him what he should see or know. He doesn't speak for him like the crowd had done. Jesus asks a question and listens. He doesn't require visual acuity to know that this man has something important to share. The man from Bethsaida's worth in this story is not restricted to him being a vehicle for a miracle. He is already whole. He is already prophetic. I recognize the presence of God in this story in a similar way to how I recognize God being present in the interaction of Mr. Rogers and five-year-old Jeff. Mr. Rogers, who always spoke directly to the camera, instead doesn't take his eyes off of Jeff. He listens so intently to his story and he sings, I like you as you are with full authenticity. And I believe him and I see God. In talking with Stephanie over the weekend to touch base about collaborating for today, she offered me the education she had recently received that there are two kinds of disability. And the first is a medical disability and embodied diagnosis or experience. For the man from Bethsaida, it is his blindness. The second type of disability is social. It is how our society has not made our world accessible for those with disabilities. It is a lack of ramps so people can join their communities, a lack of closed captioning, which I'm a part of right now. Um, it is churches pushing to go back to in-service worship and continuing virtual stream, discontinuing virtual streaming options for people still at high risk. It is defining human connection in strictly neurotypical terms. When Stephanie taught me that, I suddenly realized, oh, the healing in Mark 8 is a two-part healing. Not before and after the walking trees, but rather the first part being the physical healing Jesus performs and the second part being a social healing that we are all invited into. We are invited to partner in the social healing of disability and uproot systems of power. When you prioritize relationship over the inconvenience of accommodation or name ableism in your ordination process or ask for more representation in your reading lists, you uproot something destructive and you plant something new and healthy. And that is the work we are all invited to today, together. Thank you.
A Prayer of Disability Pride by Irina Kim Eubanks. God of creativity, of diversity, multiplicity, and accessibility, you say in your house are many rooms. You build a space where all can dwell and live exactly as who we are, without shame. So forgive us for the ways that your church has shut out and shut in, for making barriers to your presence, forging walls to togetherness, creating hierarchies of bodies and minds, and building environments that are disabling. Help us co-create with you a house that welcomes the fullness of ourselves. Inspire creativity for universal design, marked not just by widened doors and ramped walkways, but also widened language and open processes. Give us fortitude to build spaces that are physically accessible and psychologically safe, welcoming of neurodiversity, acknowledging the wholeness of who we are, our complete need for each other, and every gift we bring. May your way of shalom, in which every kind of mind, body, and spirit are honored as valuable and good, be made manifest in our world so that all your children have room to flourish. Amen. If you are disabled, hear this benediction. May you be freed from the bondage of misplaced shame and blame. May you see yourself through the eyes of the divine and fully recognize the glorious image of the sacred in your holy embodiment. Now, in this moment and the next, exactly as you are, may you find rest and when you are ready, rise again to actively participate in proclaiming visions of the more just and loving world we co-create with God. And if you are able to hear this benediction, may you be given the bravery and humility to identify any false blame or burden or obstacle you are placing on those who are sick or disabled. May you be given the eyes of the divine to see the power on glorious display in the bodies and lives of those who are disabled or chronically ill. May you rise in this moment to actively participate in the miraculous social healing needed for the more just and loving world we co-create with God. Go make just peace. <laughs>